Welcome to Public Health IT. This will be a lecture on overview and contributing to public health through EHR use. This is Lecture B. The learning objectives for the overview and contributing to public health through EHR use unit are: number one, define public health pH information technology and pH informatics. Number two. Illustrate how innovative IT solutions are being applied to pH practice. Number three, explain the role of electronic health records and data exchange to clinical care and healthcare improvement. And four, describe pH organizational structure. Public health (HIT) is the term used to describe the application of computers and technology in public health. Public health informatics is another term that is important to be familiar with, since it is also used when public health interacts with health information technology. While sometimes used interchangeably with health information (HIT), professionals in the field of informatics assert that informatics is more about information than it is about technology. Informatics is more about using technology to help people do cognitive tasks better. Than it is about building systems to mimic or replace human expertise. Public health informatics is defined as a systematic application of information and computer science and technology to public health practice, research, and learning. Simply stated, it is the application of informatics methods and theories to solve public health problems. The roots of modern public health informatics may be traced back to the major cholera outbreak in London in 1954, when John Snow used what can be thought of as the first geographical information GIS system. He drew by hand and plotted the relevant 1854 London Street, the location of the deaths, and the position of the 13 water pumps. He then discovered that almost all of the deaths were around the same water pump. He took the map to city authorities and convinced them, for whatever reason, the deaths were coming from this particular water pump. The authorities took off the handle, and suddenly the spread of cholera stopped. The problem became clear when John Snow stopped focusing on single patients and tackled the problem from the population-based orientation. The next big realization happened after mapping the death cases with their geographical attributes to their corresponding addresses. And comparing it to the geographical attributes of the water pump. This is exactly what we do in these days with GIS or geographical information systems. The added value was control of the cholera epidemic. Public health has always used data to monitor the public health, and several sources of data are collected. For example, approximately 190 data sources are being used to collect progress of Healthy People 2010 health objectives for the nation. Key challenges are that the data are collected categorically, therefore exists in silos, lack standards, and interoperability. Public health reporting is slow and not suitable for responding to bioterrorism and emerging infectious disease. Another challenge is that there currently exists a major gap between public health and healthcare. While the way data had been collected by public health may have been suitable in the past. The events of September 11, 2001, really showed weakness in the public health infrastructure to respond to urgency, to the threat of bioterrorism, and to the anthrax events that followed. Examples of how innovative IT solutions are being applied to public health practice are illustrated in the following examples. First, to improve the way outbreak detection and response is currently practiced, following September 11, 2001. There was focus on rethinking current surveillance methods, so that the response could be quicker and timelier. The increase in the use of electronic health records, and in patient health records, also provides for new health information technology-driven solutions that will enable improved communication between clinical practice and public health agencies. Several examples will be presented in this series of lectures that follow. For now. Brief examples will be provided to illustrate how provider-centric electronic health records, with alerts and decision support, can transform public health practice. 
Public health enabled electronic health records can assist in a more upstream approach at the point of care. For delivering preventative health services, such as screening recommendations and counseling services to reduce a patient's high-risk health behavior. Patient-centric electronic health records and patient health records, as they become adopted, provide new opportunities for patients to begin to manage their own health and can facilitate the delivery of educational services to promote healthful lifestyle practices. As we have learned, this focus on prevention and reducing risk is consistent with public health functions and services. Syndromic surveillance is an example of HIT applied to public health practice. Syndromic surveillance is defined as real-time public health surveillance using data that is routinely collected for other purposes. Public health has a long-standing legal mandate to conduct surveillance. The example shown is for New York State. Other states have similar legal mandates. Following the events of September 11th, new requirements for surveillance have emerged. The requirements are for fast detection, to respond to the threats of bioterrorism and emerging diseases. Fast science is needed to understand the relationships between the type of agents that are released and how to control the damage that potentially can ensue. There needs to be fast and effective communication. There needs to be fast and effective integration of various different types of data that are being monitored. There needs to be fast and effective action. Without fast and effective action, early detection has limited value. And finally, a global view of surveillance is needed, since in today's highly connected world, the spread of disease is no longer a local concern. Disease outbreaks could occur in several ways. In looking at this scenario by dimensions of cases and days, release of an infectious agent, whether it be terrorism or natural outbreak, release occurs at day zero. Comparing symptom onset, which is the way syndromic surveillance is conducted compared to more traditional surveillance, which relies on laboratory diagnosis, we can see that there is a time difference in detecting an event following release. In the case of the syndromic surveillance, detection occurs after three and one half days. With traditional surveillance, detection occurs at day 7. In this illustration, syndromic surveillance enables the threat to be detected three and one-half days earlier than traditional surveillance. The exact number of days between syndromic surveillance and more traditional surveillance depends on several factors including the agent itself, how it's dispersed, and location. But this example illustrates the benefit to conducting syndromic surveillance as compared to more traditional surveillance particularly when time is essential, as in cases of bioterrorism and the rapid spread of deadly infectious agents throughout a population. The way that data is collected for surveillance systems and the type of data collected will vary. We can see here that initially at day one, corresponding to the day an agent might be released, individuals typically will feel fine. Day two, symptoms begin to occur. Maybe the patient experiences headache and fever, and goes to the drugstore to buy over-the-counter medications, such as Tylenol. On day three, perhaps there is onset of cough. The patient then might decide to call a nurse hotline. Day four might be the time when the patient decides to see a doctor. Events may be then monitored through nurses' hotlines. On day five, the condition would typically worsen. It's at this point when a patient might decide to call an ambulance, report sick, be seen in the emergency department. All these events may be monitored by syndromic surveillance systems as compared to the events noted on days 7 and 8, which are monitored by traditional surveillance systems. New syndromic surveillance methods can detect illness in populations soon after the onset of symptoms, for example by monitoring over-the-counter medication purchases. These methods can assist with emergency preparedness. However, the same infrastructure and capabilities used to support data capture at the point of care for emergency preparedness can most definitely be used to implement non-attack public health intervention. Here is an example of what can be learned by monitoring tobacco cessation aids sold at large pharmaceutical chains. What you see here is the tracking of tobacco cessation aids following the increase of tax for cigarettes. It's clear from this chart that as tax increases, 
smoking cessation aids purchased at pharmacies increases. The first increase in cessation aid purchases follows the tax increase of 39. The second follows the $1.42 tax increase. We are able to learn from these data that increasing the tax on cigarettes will also increase smoking cessation attempts. This is another slide to show the benefit of monitoring emergency room drug calls over time. There are three peaks as in emergency room calls for drug overdoses, and that each peak occurs right at New Year's Eve. So what can public health learn, and what can public health do based on this data? These data provide evidence that New Year's Eve leads to an increase in drug use and drug overdose. The public health officials who have this data in hand can justify, for example, a mass media campaign to warn the public about drug use, armed with evidence rather than anecdotes to justify actions that could potentially save lives. The major causes of death and what public health is concerned about other than bioterrorism and infectious diseases are the health behaviors that people engage in on a day-to-day -day basis. We learned earlier about the hazards related to tobacco use, poor diet, and obesity. This data shows a comparison of 1993 data and 2004 data, and we can see that there are substantial deaths that can be prevented if people engaged in more helpful practices and reduced high-risk behaviors. This and the chronic disease that are associated with these behaviors are important priorities for public health. What follows is a series of slides that plot obesity trends. Obesity in this graph is defined as a BMI over 30. The chart that you're seeing comes from the Centers for Disease Control. As we flip through the slides, we begin to see increasing obesity trends. This chart is for 1999. This is for 2000. The data is collected by the Centers for Disease Control Behavioral Risk Factors Surveillance System, BRFSS, and is a good example of how data is collected by the Centers for Disease Control to monitor population health. We're beginning in this 2001 graph to see trends continue to see increase as reflected by the red. In 2002, the number of states noted in red continue to increase, which indicates in this chart obesity greater than 25%. In 2003, states noted in red continue to increase, and the number of states with obesity at greater than 20% also increase. This last slide is for 2006, and the numbers of obese Americans continue to climb beyond 2006. A common assumption is that if we can throw more money in healthcare, we're likely to see improvement in healthcare status. This slide shows the relationship of the United States relative to other countries in the world. The United States currently spends more per capita on healthcare than any other industrialized country. And yet we see that more spending does not reflect the health improvement in the population. The connection between clinical and population health remains an important goal for public health information technology. This slide shows a two-way flow of information, where the information that's collected at the point of care through clinical information systems, electronic health records, can be aggregated and sent to public health. Clinical data collected through electronic health records at the point of care can be aggregated and used to inform public health about the health status of populations. This two-way reporting both from public health to clinical care and from clinical care to public health remains one of the greatest challenges and can provide major benefits to improving public health practice. In an article entitled, Redesigning Electronic Health Record Systems to Support Public Health, Kukovka and colleagues provided examples of how electronic record systems could provide enormous advances for public health practice, research, and policy. We previously learned how point-of-care data from the electronic health record supports syndromic surveillance. For clinicians, a public health-oriented EHR system could reduce the paperwork burden of public health reporting and provide decision support about community-level trends that could aid in diagnosis and treatment choice. Similarly, for institutions, automated reporting would reduce paperwork burdens 
and data input costs as a trend continues toward more reporting requirements. Automated reporting also has the potential to improve documented adherence to quality assurance criteria. EHR systems could offer new opportunities for patient involvement in their own medical care, including informing patients through new methods and promoting a sense of ownership of their health information. A patient-oriented EHR could represent a major departure from the classic patient health record, which has traditionally remained in the hands of the clinician. EHR systems could be used to expand patient education opportunities. Electronic systems could help produce tailored preventative health information, reminders, and alerts based on personal clinical records that could be sent directly to individuals. New York City provides perhaps one of the earliest examples about how electronic health records are being used for public health purposes. In New York City, an existing electronic health record has been enhanced to include alerts and decision support, based on 10 steps for a healthier New York. Notice the 10 steps that are listed on this slide are connected to the leading causes of preventable death that have been discussed previously, smoking and chronic disease, which include heart disease and diabetes. This slide shows data collected from an electronic health record when an electronic reminder was used to prompt providers to vaccinate adults aged 65 and over. When the electronic health record began prompting providers to administer the vaccine, there was correspondingly an increase in the number of adults over the age of 65 that vaccinated according to the guideline. Such alerts that are part of electronic health record systems have important potential to improve preventative and public health services at the point of care to reach populations with, or at risk for, a range of chronic diseases. The public health enterprise includes a diverse set of agencies and partner organizations. There are 60 state and territorial health departments and approximately 3,000 local health departments. State and local public health agencies have a direct role in the delivery of essential public health services. Federal government agencies, including the Centers for Disease Control, CDC, play a crucial role in protecting and improving the health of the population by providing leadership in setting health goals, policies, and standards. More than 100,000 professionals work in public health, representing more than 50 different disciplines. The public health infrastructure also includes 115 affiliated public health agencies and organizations, including NACCHO, the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials, ASTHO, the Association of Schools of Public Health, and the American Public Health Association, APHA. However, governmental public health agencies alone cannot assure the nation's health. This illustration has been referred to as the eggs or the web. It is a cluttered representation of the complexity of a public health system and examples of organizations and groups that make up the system network. There are many partners and groups represented who contribute to health and delivery of public health functions and the essential public health services. There are many opportunities with the emergence of electronic health records at the intersection of public health and health information technology for this complex public health system to improve, even transform, the way public health services are provided in the years to come. We have reviewed some solutions that address the challenges that result from data collected categorically in silos and lacking standards and interoperability. New syndromic surveillance methods can detect illness in populations soon after the onset of symptoms. The same infrastructure used to support data capture at the point of care for emergency preparedness can be used to implement non-attack public health intervention. Clinical data collected through electronic health records can inform public health about the health status of populations. Alerts that are part of electronic health record systems can improve preventive and public health services at the point of care to reach populations with or at risk for a range of chronic diseases. The connection between clinical and population health remains an important goal for public health information technology. There is a need for both clinical and public health professionals to understand how public health information technology can be used to close the gap between how data that is collected for public health and clinical care can be used for improving the health of all.